Thanks, Nigel. Um, you may have heard the news that the government has announced that as from tomorrow, it will no longer be illegal for churches to allow people in for private prayer, not tourism. Of course, this doesn't mean that many churches must or will necessarily open soon. There are serious questions of public liability and risk assessments of the need for daily deep cleaning and supervision to ensure social distancing together with the protection of volunteers, which mean that for some time into the future, we won't be able to open St Nicholas's. We do, of course, want to help and encourage those who are looking for a place to pray and feel the impulse to come into church. We need to try and provide help to everyone to pray at home or outside on a walk or perhaps particularly in the churchyard although I see it's just started raining very hard here, so uh, you might not want to be in the churchyard at the moment, but to spread the reassurance and understanding that God hears our prayers wherever we are, whether we're in a special church building or not. I expect that before long it will become legal again for churches to allow some kind of corporate worship to take place in the building as well, but it will be very restricted. Many people, especially those over the age of 70 or vulnerable for other reasons, will need to stay away. Social distancing will have to be observed. Numbers will be seriously restricted. Nobody will touch a Bible, a hymn sheet or a hymn book or a notice sheet. And perhaps one of the most serious restrictions is that singing together is going to be forbidden for a long time to come. So again, Sadly, we won't jump to do as much as is allowed as soon as it's allowed. It would be quite a loss not to be able to sing together and live streaming in the kind of way that we've been doing since March will need to continue. Why is singing such an important part of our getting together? as church. Some of us sing out loud with the hymns in the live stream services, some in household groups and some alone and some watch and sing in our hearts but aren't singing out as we might have enjoyed in the past in church. Perhaps it feels just too uncomfortable and weird at home. Even so, I think our services would lose a lot if we didn't include songs of praise. Christians have always sung whenever they get together, right from New Testament times when the Lord Jesus followed the Old Testament practice of singing hymns with his disciples. Why is singing so important? In the last few weeks of looking at Isaiah's prophecies, we've seen some tough messages of judgment against those who set themselves against the Lord. We're completing now this focus on the second section of Isaiah as we've got it divided into five and we've just been looking over the last few weeks at chapters 13 to 27. We haven't read every verse in the section but most of it and we've tried to get a flavour of all of it. The most chilling chapter probably is the one that we've skipped over, chapter 24, where Isaiah looks beyond the judgment on the nations around him in the coming years to the final judgment of the whole earth. When everything that makes human life sustainable and enjoyable is systematically destroyed. We may spot echoes in the environmental destruction going on now. But the picture in Isaiah 24 is more devastating than Greta Thunberg's worst nightmares. And yet, even as Isaiah foresees this big judgment with his long range eschatological goggles, can you guess what he hears? Well, look at chapter 24, verse 16. From the ends of the earth, we hear singing. Glory to the righteous one. This singing comes from a faithful remnant when the rest of the world have been judged for their rebellion against God. This remnant is a major theme in the 
book of Isaiah as a whole when I uh, in verse 13 of chapter 24 these people are like a few grapes left on the vine after the harvest in verse 14 they raise their voices they shout for joy what have they got to sing and shout about in chapters 25 and 26 we hear more of the content of their songs and shouts of praise and chapter 25 verses 1 to 9 is where Isaiah gives us some reasons to praise God so I'm going to work through just those nine verses and give some pointers as we go to other parts of this section and that Rachel read so clearly to us look at uh, 25 verse 1 Lord you are my God I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things or marvellous things as my bible says I've got the old NIV which we also have in church at the moment though looking possibly to replace it sometime soon we praise God for what he has done he is not just sitting up in his heaven in splendid isolation leaving us to suffer down here he is involved in human history he cares and he has revealed what he's like by both speaking and acting so God's people praise him we praise him because he planned everything from long ago verse 1 nothing takes God by surprise he had it all planned he's in control he's not making it up as he goes along like our government is and we ourselves are he has a proper plan and that plan the New Testament tells us has from eternity centered on his son the Lord Jesus his death and resurrection were not a setback and dramatic plan B but were all part of the plan to save all his people he planned everything from long ago nothing takes him by surprise I've recently seen that little um, video clip that's been doing the rounds on the internet I wonder if you've seen it with Michael McIntyre seeing a fortune teller and the crystal ball imagining last year looking forward to this year and all those things that just didn't make sense at all and completely took us by surprise God knew about all that and we praise him because he humbles the proud verses 2 and 3 he made the fortified city verse 2 a heap of rubble showing how useless for people to trust in their own resources and defenses therefore verse 3 strong peoples will honor you cities of ruthless nations will revere you just as every knee shall bow before the Lord Jesus and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in the end as the New Testament tells us the message of the cross of Jesus is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 as a stumbling block to proud people the cross of Jesus turns everything upside down and it's through that that God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him Isaiah 25 10 says God will bring down their pride despite the cleverness of their hands. God hates human pride. The mind boggles as to why any Christian would want to identify with a movement that calls itself pride. See the triumph of the humble over the proud in verse 5. He humbles those who dwell on high he lays the lofty city low he levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust feet trample it down the feet of the oppressed the footsteps of the poor I wonder if you find that image resonates with what we've been seeing in the news over the last week or so. Statues topple and are cast down into the dust or into Bristol Harbour. Or 17 years ago, the statue of Saddam pulled down by US Marines in Baghdad, stamped on by the shoes of the people he had oppressed. I feel I should say something about all this 
statue toppling today. I expect you might agree with me in wanting to say something on both sides or else you might want to discuss it afterwards. Certainly the Black Lives Matter demonstrations have a point. I'm sure there has been unacknowledged racial prejudice and discrimination in our society that is not all gone and that we need to root out and repent of. All human beings are made in the image of God and are of equal value. The transatlantic slave trade was a horrendous evil and we should be grateful for Christians like Wilberforce and shine a light on the blind spot that allows someone like Edward Colston to be so honoured when it's so tied up with the slave trade. Seeing pictures of that statue coming down felt like a wrong being righted and yet it was in the wrong way. It should have happened sooner through due process. With my limited knowledge I think I'm of the opinion that the police were wise not to intervene once they found themselves in that situation which it seems to me would have turned heavy-handed and stoked up more violence but we do need law and order to be maintained and protesters must not take the law into their own hands with all the other statues commemorating heroes who did good things but whose flaws may or may not be serious enough to outweigh the good being celebrated. These things need to be discussed calmly and appropriate action taken legally. And we need to take care not to airbrush these wrongs out of our history as we take care not to glory in them. God humbles the proud and praise him that he keeps the poor and needy safe. Verse four, you've been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall and like the heat of the desert, you silence the uproar of foreigners as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. In our climate, we don't often experience the sun going in as such relief, but we do know what he means. It's God himself who is the refuge, not here the strong walled city of Jerusalem, even though Zion so often represents God's protection. That's something worth remembering when we can't go into our lovely old stone church to pray. It's not those stones that hear our prayers. It's the omnipresent Lord. He's with you on your sofa there in your pyjamas. He can see you. He'll protect you if you turn to him. Praise God that he will provide a great feast for all peoples. When we were reading Matthew's Gospel in church last year, we looked back at this verse in Isaiah, verse 6, when we saw how Jesus feeding the 5,000 hinted at the fulfilment of this prophecy. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. Maybe we see it in Jesus turning water into wine as well in John's Gospel, but it's when Jesus fed the 4,000 in a Gentile area that this is most relevant because it's for all peoples, not just the Jews, not just Israel, and it should go without saying, not just white people. This is strong impetus for us to oppose all racism. Here's a picture from Bath's own Black Lives Matter rally at the end of last week. There's a, a Christian in the foreground holding up a Bible because the message of the scriptures is of God's love for all peoples. Black lives matter to God. Our society's Christian roots demand that we value people from all ethnic backgrounds equally. 
The food isn't all that Isaiah is pointing forward to with his long range vision. Praise God that he will destroy death. Look at verse seven. And if you're feeling afraid of death, take this to heart. If you've lost a loved one to that great enemy, death, hear this promise from our promise keeping God. If the tears keep coming and you've got problems that don't look as though they're going to go away in this life, take verse seven and eight with you, hold on to these words, look at them now. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples the sheet that covers up the nations, that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. People sometimes quite rightly observe that in God's unfolding revelation of himself in the scriptures, even though the Old Testament is consistent with the new, it's very different because it's focused on, on this world, whereas the New Testament has eternity and the age to come very much more in focus. But there are various hints throughout the Old Testament that even though people's view is mainly limited to this life, Old Covenant believers had an idea that this is not all there is to life. And here is possibly the clearest reference to resurrection in the whole of the Old Testament here in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19. But your dead will live, Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. And we know how the fulfilment of that comes. Jesus pulled a few people back from the grave and he said to Lazarus's sister, I am the resurrection and the life. When Jesus died, Matthew tells us that at that moment, the earth shook, the rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Those people must have ended up eventually back in their graves again, but not forever because Jesus rose on that Easter Sunday, never to die again. Those events, 700 years after Isaiah and 2000 years before us, pointed forward to the complete fulfillment of this prophecy. The day when death is finally destroyed and the Lord ultimately wipes away every tear when you and I and countless others will join in the great song in that day with no fear of passing on any virus as we throw back our heads and sing at the top of our voices. Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Let's pray. Father God, you are our God. We're so uplifted to have you as our God. You do marvellous things and we're proud of you as our God. We want to tell the world of the wonderful things you've done. You have defeated death through the death of your son. We want to sing about it, to rejoice and be glad in your salvation. We can't be proud of ourselves, only of you. 
because we didn't do anything to save ourselves. We just trusted you and you saved us. You delight to save those who trust you. So keep us in the faith. Keep us trusting you. When we feel afraid and our faith wobbles, help us to look to you and know that you're strong. You do marvellous things. Keep us relying on you and keep us looking beyond the struggles of this life, looking forward to that great banquet with the best meat and the finest ever wine, together with all your people from every race, when we will be with you forever. Amen.